Welcome to Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology. Licensed clinical psychologist Dr. Levine brings viewers success stories by demonstrating how the brain works and neuroscience-based pragmatic ways to retain the brain to improve emotional regulation. So now, please welcome your host, Dr. Levine. Welcome to Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology. I'm Dr. Levine. You're watching us on Bold Brave TV. Well, for the last several weeks, we've been going over our emotional regulation uh, program, uh, delving deeper into various parts of it. And along the way, you've been uh, picking up some knowledge and some skills. And today is a we kind of consolidate what we've been doing and make sure that um, we're making progress and make sure that you catch all uh, that's been offered. So. I'm going to uh, review the program and what we're going to do is start from the beginning. So <clears throat> we discuss having a three-phase program for emotional regulation and wellness. The first phase, which is what we've covered so far, is stress relief and increasing your function. So usually this happens within two to eight weeks. Um, we'll, we'll move forward uh, in the rest of the program to start talking about stress management, making some lifestyle changes, and then the last that we're all faced with stress. Uh, stress equals a demand, any demand on us. And the stress response <clears throat> requires both emotional coping and solution coping. So the example we've used uh, is a flat tire. When you get a flat tire, the first response is, oh, poop. That's the emotional part. And then you have to change the tire. Now, there's a lot of sources of stress, and stress comes along with many uh, other things. So there's a continuum of if a situation is stressing you and you're stuck there, eventually it becomes anxiety. And if you stay stuck in anxiety, eventually depression. So we have all of our stress related to all the anxiety and depression, this mood disorders. But we also have uh, stressful situations like a bad divorce or a health situation, or maybe you have ADHD and the stress along with that. All these things will have placed demands on your stress response and will require you to have some level of ability to uh, regulate your emotions. So one key concept is that 95% of our processing is below our level of awareness. So what that means is that uh, until something gets significant enough to be brought into our awareness, we may not even uh, know it's going on. We get triggered uh, by conditions <coughs> without our permission, meaning that our childhoods or experiences can trigger anxiety, a bad dental trip, all kinds of things can trigger uh, anxiety and stress uh, at a sense level. The example I use for that is we probably all have had the experience of kind of tensing up a little bit at the tone of our mother's voice. Haven't even heard what she has to say, but we've been conditioned that when we hear that tone, we know that we have to pay attention. The last thing, key concept here is top-down versus bottom-up processing. What that means is that uh, that 95, our emotional regulation, the emotional part of our brain can be triggered and is subconscious, but we also have our thinking, which 
both contribute to our emotional regulation. Uh, and historically, medication's been pretty good for bottom up and therapies top down. But with new mind body techniques, we're going to approach uh, both top down and bottom up to therapy. And this kind of explains why a lot of uh, therapy, people have been in therapy a long time and maybe not have gotten the full benefit or they've been on meds for a long time, but they still have to keep taking the medication. So let's talk a little bit and remind, uh, review uh, some of the neuroscience. This is a practical neuroscience. <clears throat> in our midbrain, we have an area called the amygdala and it's the area that gets conditioned to the response. So quite often, uh, you know, in prehistoric context, uh, the leaves would rustle, the lion would come out. So what the brain would remember is the leaves rustling. So then when the sensations occur, it would dump adrenaline in so you'd be prepared for the lion. What that means in our, um, in our real world is that we're constantly being conditioned and triggered for all kinds of things. And we may not even know what it is that triggered our anxiety, or we may know what the last trigger was, but it's on top of already having quite a bit of anxiety as a baseline. And lastly, the, uh, there's a 90 second rule that if you can just not feed the stressor, i.e. thinking about it, then there's a loop that comes back and turns off that, uh, that trigger of adrenaline and cortisol and the stress response. So part of our challenge is to find a way of uh, breaking the cycle. Now, one of the issues with top-down is once we've been triggered, we're looking for the lion. And the more we look, the more problems we look for, the more problem solving, the more we think about either the problem or the solution, we can continue to dump more adrenaline and cortisol and we can cycle up. And this is how we go from just being anxious to being uh, very anxious to the point of a panic attack. One of the things that we, we've learned is that if you're already a pretty anxious person, it's easier to get to a panic attack. And once you're highly anxious, what you'll find is that that, those, that fear of panic gets generalized to more and more situations, particularly ones where you can't escape. So that's how anxiety and stress gets programmed in or conditioned in. <coughs> so, how do we actually get out of Well, to understand that that amygdala has no connection to our thinking brain. In other words, we can't say to ourselves, calm down. We can't use reasoning necessarily to calm down because that midbrain responds only to sensations from experience. In psychological terms, we call that exposure therapy. But to, to actually have extinction happen, the exposure needs to be within a zone, a functional zone. In other words, <clears throat> if Johnny's sitting at a desk and his head's on the desk, he's not going to learn much. Or if he's jumping up and around and not paying attention, he's not going to learn much. So what we have to do, if say we have a fear of driving, we have to be a little anxious, a little aroused but not so far that we start triggering our panic attacks. So there's a, a zone of optimum that we need to be in. The exposure should be about 20 minutes long. And to do this, we require some cognitive control. In other words, we need to learn some skills to regulate our emotions so we can stay within that zone. So part of uh, exposure of therapy for anxiety or panic attacks or phobias is to learn enough 
regulatory control that you can go back and actually um, affect uh, staying in that zone. <clears throat> so there's actually a, a loop that we're going to go through several times. One is first you got to have an awareness and back to that 95% of our um, functionings below our level of awareness. So we got to be aware of what is it that's triggering us, right? Uh, what is our think? What are our thinking patterns that are uh, escalating it? And then we have to learn new skills to be able to handle whatever the issue is. So we're going to loop through awareness, set intention, and learn new sk skills. First, to be able to cope with how we've already been conditioned and to function better. Then we're going to go through this loop again to figure out how do we actually change uh, our reaction to life and uh, manage and get better life balance. And then one more time, we're going to shift from the negative emotions, which is why most people come to therapy for their anxiety or their anger or their frustration, their sadness, to how do you uh, actually go through a process where on a daily basis you're a positive being. So we're going to go through this in three phases. The first takes between two and ten weeks where we're working on getting some emotional regulation. A lot of that depends on what types of things you've tried in the past. The second is probably about four to six weeks. And then the last becomes kind of a lifelong process, but it only takes a couple of weeks to put the practice in place. And then you just constantly are increasing your awareness and learning new skills. So relief and functioning. We start at the bottom here. The first thing uh, we learned was <clears throat> to was the arousal scale. So we understand how high our arousal is. The second uh, uh, skill is condition relaxation and to be able to tolerate distress. The third skill is to practice visualization so we can actually change our emotions and our mind states. And then the next skill in this phase is to practice mindfulness to catch our arousal earlier in the process. So we'll come back to this a little later, but this is the four skills we're going to learn. We're going to look, we've learned the scale. We learned how to condition relaxation and some distress management. We learned to practice visualization and mindfulness. Okay, so we're going to review these tools, the scale, the top down and bottom up and points of intervention, bottom up skills and top down skills. Okay, starting at the bottom, one to 10, <clears throat> depending upon how much adrenaline, cortisol and stress hormones we have, we, we can actually, our behaviors and our thinkings change. So if we have no emotion or very low arousal, we're probably not going to do much. We're not motivated. We're on the couch. A little more arousal. This is what people consider arousal or uh, normal. In other words, if they weren't a little anxious or a little excited, they wouldn't uh, go to work. But they're not so aroused that they're aware of an emotion. So it tends to be out of your awareness. A little more adrenaline, like a deadline, you become aware that maybe you're a little anxious, a little irritated or excited, but now the adrenaline, because it's fight or flight, causes you to focus on the threat and gives you some more energy. So four is optimum performance. That's why when we have deadlines, we do better than when we don't, because we have a little stress hormone to help us perform better. But unfortunately, in, even if we're successful at pretty much staying at a four, other things can happen on top of that baseline, 
level and we can be uh, triggered to become anxious or worry or anticipate. In other words, with a little bit more, now we're focused too much on the threat or the solution. So where I had a test tomorrow with a deadline, when I'm at a four, I'll study for the test and I'll do well. It motivates me. At five, I'll be so worried about the test that I'll have difficulty staying on task. A little more adrenaline and cortisol, then it drives avoidance behaviors. Can be below the level of awareness. This may be where people say they don't care or they may get angry <clears throat> and just avoid people or situations. It may be subconscious avoidance. We just subtly stop going out or dealing with other people. And quite often we can end up with paralysis. Uh, often people will think they're procrastinators and think they have a, a some kind of uh, character defect when in fact they're just stressed more than they know. And up to six, for the most part, people don't come to see a psychologist or work on it. This is just some of the normal levels of anxiety and stress we go through every day, uh, when we say stuck at a six or stuck at a five, that it becomes a mood disorder. But still, what will happen is people will have a good day and they won't come. But when it gets to seven, now the sensations from the uh, physical sensations from the adrenaline and cortisol are just too hard to ignore. Uh, there'll be difficulty sleeping, they'll feel tension, maybe appetite or not appetite, crave carbohydrates, some digestion problems. Eight, they'll become driven, got to do it. Uh, some behaviors. Nine, a little bit more, you might get to derealization where you kind of feel distance. And then 10, you could end up with a full-blown panic attack from the adrenaline and cortisol. So this is a scale, and what's important is to understand where your baseline is on the scale. It's a daily tool. So you're watching Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology, and we're going to go right into some of the things we can do about being at a five after this short break. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy easysense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Levine. You're watching us on Bold Brave TV. We're doing a review of the Emotional Regulation Program, and welcome back. And we just covered 
the scale from one to 10 for arousal. And now we're gonna see how do you apply this practically in your daily life. So if you think about it, when you wake up in the morning, right? Um, we carry some anxiety from, we can carry some anxiety from the previous day. You may wake up and you're just perfectly calm, or you may wake up and you're already at a five, worried about the day, concerned about getting things done, anticipating problems. So one of the suggestions of using the scale is in the morning, as part of your morning routine, is just learn to do a mindful process check and evaluate what's my baseline uh, arousal level. So what happens is whatever our baseline is, we start the day and slowly over the course of the day we'll be triggered by everything from being stuck at a traffic light to um, to cashier to whatever our little uh, triggers are. And most times they'll be below the level of awareness and whatever little surge of adrenaline and cortisol we might feel will be metabolized fairly shortly. So somebody cuts us off, we get agitated, we jump up to, you know, a, a seven or an eight and swear at them, you know, or, or cut them off. But then within a few minutes, it comes back down. So one of the things that happens is we hit these triggers from the bottom up, like that person cutting us over. And what happens is we become aware of the rush. So in the case of a car cutting us too close, we could uh, do one of two things. We could, uh, we start the, the top down uh, processing. We could um, think about, uh, you know, this person's an awful person, blah, blah, blah. And we could bring it up or we could do some distress tolerance, just sit with that discomfort. And it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to metabolize uh, one level of my scale away. So one of the things that we have to do with our top down processing is first stop working things up and learn how to work things down. And over time, we get conditioned without our permission. So uh, maybe at one point we had a panic attack on a bridge. So now I have fear of going over bridges. So now I got to be retrain my brain to get past that fear of bridges. <clears throat> so there's a number of bottom-up processing skills, <clears throat> we can think of our, we tend to think of our brains as just one thing, but we actually have different areas that process different information. Uh, we have our thinking area and our prefrontal cortex, which thinks in thoughts and reasoning, but we have an emotional processing area in our limbic regions where that part of our brain processes based upon sensations and experience. So you can't talk to yourself and say, calm down. But what you can do is you can condition the relaxation response. And what I found is that with most of my clients have been gone to therapy for a long time uh, and still have anxiety, that a big area that uh, has been missed in their uh, skills training in, in therapy is the actual conditioning of relaxation. And there's no shortcut here. It takes at least two weeks of practicing a relaxation exercise uh, every day and maybe even longer if, you know, uh, your baseline levels are high and you can't focus on the exercise. So we condition the relaxation. Uh, my favorite tool is progressive muscle relaxation. Um, and other 
uh, techniques are breathing, uh, use biofeedback, can use hypnosis. There's any number of ways to actually condition the relaxation response, which is the parasympathetic, so that people can relax on command. So what this allows, and most people have been conditioned without their permission to go from zero to 60 pretty quickly, right? You can be uh, agitated quickly, or you can be, uh, you're triggered pretty, pretty quickly to escalate. But being able to bring themselves down is, is a challenge. The next thing is learning some distress tolerance skills. What this means is that with the adrenaline and cortisol, once you've been triggered and say you're at a seven or an eight, and you're having difficulty sleeping, right? Or you're, you're being driven, then you have to be able to sit with that discomfort because the avoidance strengthens anxiety or builds the anxiety. So how do you sit with the discomfort? Well, your body has to metabolize that, those stress hormones. And this is where uh, things like exercise, journaling, different various ways of processing that emotion that are helpful uh, come into play. So you have to learn how maybe praying, uh, being able to uh, talk. Uh, what doesn't work very well is the avoidance like substance abuse and a lot of other things that people use to cope with the emotional demands but end up being dysfunctional. You have to learn enough top-down skills so that you're not feeding the bottom up. Um, and what we're going to do to retrain uh, that conditioning they have where you're being triggered by flying or heights or the sound of people's voice or uh, people pleasing. What we have to do is we build a hierarchy of uh, how much each one of these things trigger you. Some things trigger you more than others. And then what we have to do is go through a process of reconditioning or retraining your brain for each rung in the ladder. So if I have somebody say, who's got a fear of flying, we might start out with planning a trip and then, you know, go into the airport and then a short trip. So each rung working their way up the ladder. And sometimes it can be, um, Sometimes it can, uh, we can be a little misled. Uh, I had a guy who had a fear. He thought of bridges. It wasn't until we got into exposure. It really was fear of being over the water. It was the water sensations triggering them. So we had to adjust our hierarchy. So one of the things that we'll find as we go through is lots of times because we don't really know what's going on underneath is that uh, we'll attribute the fear to something when in fact it's something else. <coughs> and there's a whole bunch of new skills that we'll learn along the way. So from top down, right, we, we need to learn uh, some new skills to control our emotions. And one of the first skills is to understand how we actually appraise situations. Uh, it's been termed a primary and secondary appraisals. Even out of our awareness, we appraise a situation subconsciously based upon our lifetime of experience. Somebody says something with a certain tone and we immediately have an emotional reaction. Now, sometimes those emotional reactions are much stronger than the current situation is because we're really reacting to that conditioning from our past. Uh, say some, we're hyper sensitive to being criticized because we had a really critical parent. So viscerally, we could react very strongly to what sounds like criticism or, or putting us down. 
This is when the emotion comes up into our uh, awareness. That's when we can do our secondary appraisal. And this is where we look at the situation and we say, am I really as under threat as much as my emotion uh, is telling me? Because emotions are information. And quite often we can just reframe the situation and uh, one of the things that we need to do when we're reframing is start looking at our beliefs and our attitudes because our emotion is a result of our attitude and our attitude is the result of our beliefs. So we can't change necessarily our uh, emotion, but what we can do is work on our beliefs. So if I'm reacting too strongly to criticism, maybe it's because I have a core belief that everybody has to like me or that I have to be perfect to be okay. And then I have to start challenging those beliefs and have new experiences where it's okay, where everybody doesn't like me, or it's okay if I make mistakes. So we've come up to another uh, break. And right after the break, we're going to continue our review of Dr. Levine's anxiety and stress uh, emotional regulation program. So come back right after this short break. I'm Dr. Levine, and this is Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like... I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Welcome back to Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology and our review of our emotional regulation program. We just wrapped up on appraisal and now uh, we, we learned some new appraisal skills. To, we're aware that we have this primary um, reaction and then uh, we get a chance to actually think about it. And when we think about it quite often, what we can do is reframe it so that our uh, reaction, our behavior is more in line with the situation. But one of the other top-down uh, processing skills is we learned that the stress hormones focus us on the threat, which is why we become, you know, uh, obsessed about the threat. We worry, we anticipate. We may get as equally as uh, narrow focus on the solution. So how do we broaden our attention well, one of the things that starting with the progressive muscle relaxation, when you first start that, maybe 70% of the time, 
you're not paying attention to the exercise. Maybe your anxiety's got you, your mind and your thoughts are drifting or whatever. But as you continue to do the progressive muscle relaxation and then later the mindfulness, what you'll start on, uh, doing is training that attention center of your mind so that you can focus it on the present moment. So you can focus it on the task. And part of being able to move beyond being triggered to keep a trigger to the 20 minutes instead of two hours or two days is that ability to get your mind back on task. The ability to be able to focus on what you need to be focusing on. And also one of the uh, biggest frustrations I find with people who come to me are they, they, they're really stressed out by things they cannot control. In other words, most people are very good at solving problems, but when it comes to things they can't control, they'll ruminate. And there's certain things in life that health issues, relationships, death, there's certain things we can't control. So we have to learn emotional regulation, emotional coping skills to be able to deal with those. Because what most people do is that they are much more focused on problem solving, which in most cases does make the anxiety go away, right? If we could solve the problem or the thing creating the anxiety, but it's not a complete set of tools for life because there are things we can't control. And one of the things that we need the ability to do is when we can't control or change something, have the ability to change our attention and to focus on something else so we don't continue to work it up. So what action, when we get triggered, do we really need to take? Well, one of the things we got to recognize is that the first thing we have to do is to actually recognize the problem is our stress hormone levels are too high. It's on the inside. We need to work on having the time to metabolize those stress hormones and to keep from working it up. So that's where the distress uh, tolerance skills come in. One of the keys is to um, <clears throat> keep moving. Uh, one of the uh, intense exercise, for example, can help. And then take action on something that you can control, even if it's not related. So you may be having trouble at work, but clean the car. Do something that you can control because you're going to uh, move a muscle to change a thought. So the progress to date that we've learned through this program is we learned to condition the relaxation response. And by now, you should have some tools. Uh, most of my clients will have a favorite PMR that they've selected, a progressive muscle relaxation, breathing exercise, which is about eight minutes, and I didn't really cover too much on visualization, but once you've done the uh, active progressive muscle relaxation, you can start using guided uh, recordings to visualize relaxing and your body will relax. These are the relaxation uh, guided meditations that take you to the beach or to uh, the mountains or somewhere where you can visualize being in a relaxed place and relaxing. So one of the things that doesn't work on uh, stress is reasoning, but if you wanna change the way you feel, you can do a visualization to change the way you uh, feel. Now, <clears throat> one of the key aspects of doing the relaxation exercises and making some changes in your <clears throat> everyday life is if you've been waking up or been living at a five or a six uh, with high levels of stress and anxiety or maybe even higher by practicing these skills uh, by practicing the relaxation and 
doing, uh, taking some of the stressors out of your life, you should be able to be, have your base stress levels down. And this is critical to actually start to do the, um, do the exposure therapy that you need to then be able to uh, work on other problems. So if somebody comes to me because they have panic attacks driving, until we can get their baseline stress levels down to a four, then doing the exposure is just going to almost guarantee that they're going to have a panic attack. So what we do by conditioning relaxation, teaching the distress tolerance skills, working on getting the baseline down, and in that process we've identified some key triggers, we'll be at the point where we can actually start doing that exposure. They'll be able to start doing some driving or whatever that is. In the mornings, right now, if you've conditioned the mindfulness, one of the things that you'll be able to do is do a mindful body scan and use that scale. So what we can do is we can go ahead and think about uh, doing a, one of those scans. Let's do one now. What I'd like you to do is just sit erect in your chair and start by just noticing your breath. As you breathe in, tell yourself I'm breathing in. And as you breathe out, I'm breathing out. Just pay attention to your breath, the sensations in your breath. And then start by scanning your face and your head, looking for any tension. Your shoulders. your arms. Now you're not trying to relax. What we're trying to do is notice any place you have tension, but your body telling you about what level you're at. So if you're having trouble finding any tension in your body and you're able to focus on the body sensations, then it's pretty safe to say you're at least a four or lower. <coughs> well, let's say we're down to uh, our chest and we're really having a bit of a struggle staying focused. We keep having thoughts, well, I got to get to the cleaners. I got to get to work. I don't have time for this. Ah, we know we're at least at a five because we're anxious and we're having anxious thoughts. And if I'm starting to feel like I want to avoid it, maybe I'm at a six. I get down to my stomach and I notice my stomach is doing flip-flops or i am got a lot of tension. It's where I put my stress and maybe I'm all the way at a seven. So we can tell with this uh, scan, this mindfulness scan, as we're going through our body, we'll, we'll learn to calibrate ourselves on that scale. It's much like when you first learn to drive. When you first learned to drive, you had to keep looking at the speedometer to know how fast you were going. And now you can pretty much judge your speed with rarely looking at the speedometer just from the sensations of the movement. Well, what we're doing is building a mindfulness to how aroused we are so we can bring that awareness when we're at much lower levels of stress so we don't find ourselves um uh, being triggered by a cashier or some situation because we've uh taken some ac action before then so if i'm doing this more morning mindfulness and i find that i'm at a five what i'll probably do is i'll do a good progressive muscle relaxation some other relaxation exercise to bring myself down before i do any other kind of meditation because what I want to do is catch it early, right? So that's one of the purposes of doing this uh, morning daily mindfulness in, in inventory and at least starting the day uh, 
with at least a four or below. So once again, we need to take a break from this exciting program. We'll be right back after a short commercial uh, with Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy easysense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back to Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology on Bold Brave TV. We're reviewing our progress to date in the program, some of the skills that we've learned, and we're down to daily mindfulness and inventories and managing our baseline. Okay, so what do I mean by managing our baseline? Well, what happens is, of course, we start the day out well. And we get our uh, baseline uh, stress and anxiety levels down, but then along the day, you know, we may be criticized by our boss or have a dental appointment or whatever. So now what we have to do back to uh, training our minds with mindfulness, the whole key of mindfulness is to be able to have the observer to, to observe <clears throat> that we've been triggered and then understand from our, our physiological response or our, uh, our thinking pattern that we need to do an intervention. And one of the, the interventions we can do is and one of the hardest ones, of course, is just stopping. We can recognize, okay, uh, I need to take a break. And sometimes the breaks can be relatively short if we catch it early enough. So one of the great tools to have is a, like an eight or 10 minute breathing exercise that you can do anywhere. Another is a visualization that's a few minutes long just to calm the mind and bring yourself back to maybe gratitude or, or happiness. <clears throat> so there's a number of tools that if we're mindful and we're catching ourselves when we slip up into the five, six categories, that it takes only a few minutes to bring ourselves back down. The other uh, advantage to uh, mindfulness is uh, the ability to separate and this you would just be getting to this uh, is <clears throat> the ability to separate thought from emotion so a lot of people talk about mindfulness in terms of being able to be in the moment know what's going on in the moment, focus on the moment, and all that's certainly true. But one of the things that 
as you uh, train in mindfulness, you're able to separate your feelings from your thoughts. And you're also training yourself to be able to dismiss thoughts. And this is critical to actually being able to change your reaction in life. When the thought and emotion are really fused together, for example, somebody criticizes you and it, br emotion, it quickly brings you to some kind of thought of, uh, I'm, I'm a loser, I, I can't ever get this right, I'm never going to get it right. Those thoughts and feelings are so fused together that it's hard to break that cycle. Even if in therapy, you know, you understand, no, I'm not a loser, I'm catastrophizing, whatever the label is for whatever you're doing, it's hard to change that behavior. <laughs> it's hard to, to change that. And what I like about mindfulness over some other ways of dealing with our thoughts is that once you practice mindfulness for a few weeks, you've practiced the ability to let go of thoughts without judgment, without attaching value to them. So if you get criticized, you can, it's almost like time slows down. You'll feel, oh, I'm feeling that disappointment. I'm feeling that being let down. And then when the thought arises, I'm no good or whatever that thought is, you won't be attaching any emotion to it, and you've trained to dismiss it. And the example I use quite often with people is, uh, if I tell you that the Patriots are cheaters, most of my clients don't have much reaction to that, right? Like, oh, maybe, maybe not. It's just a thought. But a, a Patriots fan would be coming right through the screen. So we do attach emotion to thoughts, and then that's part of the spiral up. So by being able to separate, uh, to actually uh, know the difference between the uh, emotion and the thought and being training the mind to not pass judgments on thoughts and to be able to dismiss the thoughts, you can start breaking that cycle that pushes you from a five or a six up to a seven or an eight. And you can get at those long standing. Uh, you may understand that you have a belief that everybody has to love you, but you can't change it until you get the skill of mindfulness where you're not reinforcing it with each uh, experience. So, so far in this program, what we've been able to do is, and what most of my clients are able to do, even if they have significant uh, generalized anxiety or uh, panic disorder or a lot of stress related to their ADHD or maybe they're going through a terrible divorce is that they're able to do is to start their day in a good place. They've learned some morning routines where whatever anxiety, frustration, sadness they carried from yesterday they're able to work it in the morning, either through doing some relaxation exercises, some meditation, maybe change their morning routine a little bit to give them some exercise to help metabolize, give themselves a break from their own thinking. So they start the day much lower by practicing this every day, uh, maybe even twice a day doing a relaxation exercise to bring their baselines down and they're able to maintain that baseline. They're learning some new ways of uh, evaluating their own thinking between the mindfulness and looking at the way they're appraising situations and shift the way they're thinking. So they start working things down. They've learned some distress tolerance skills so they can sit with the, uh, with the discomfort. Uh, most of uh, our trouble comes from trying to avoid our feelings, our reaction to the reaction. For example, if I get bitten by a dog and I'm afraid uh, of dogs and I start avoiding dogs, I'll avoid them more and more. And every time I avoid, 
uh, that dog, my fear grows stronger and stronger. So a lot of my clients are surprised that their, their fears get worse over time for apparent no reason. If that's happening to you, it's because you're using avoidance. So you're able to tolerate being around the dog so we can do the exposure to whatever it is uh, to retrain your brain. So at the end of this process, the triggers are not nearly as strong. So what you're able to do is to maintain and have emotional regulation and keep yourself out of the panic zone, uh, functional and focusing on the tasks that you need to focus on. So we're glad to have you at our program here for Dr. Levine's Neur Practical Neuropsychology. This first phase of the program where we're learning emotional regulation and <clears throat> becoming more functional prepares us for the next phase, which is making the changes in our life to reduce our overall stress and prepare us for a more positive and happy being. So thanks once again for joining us on Bold Brave TV. This is Dr. Levine in Practical Neuropsychology. We'll see you next week on Monday at 11 a.m. This has been Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology Show. Break old patterns and easily change negative habits with lessons that keep rewarding you for the rest of your life. Here Mondays at 1 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave TV Network.